We've got some questions prepared, so let's have the first one, please, from Mark von Hartmann. Um, hello. There is a lot of attention given by the press to the subcontracting of health and social care services to the private sector. There seems to be a commonly held perception amongst the general pu public that healthcare provision is too important to put into the hands of private companies who are only interested in making profits out of the sick and the elderly. Does the panel accept that private organisations can and do provide a conscientious and caring level of service, often at a fraction of the cost that it would take the NHS or social services to supply themselves? David Pryor. That's a nice one to start with. I, I, I completely agree. It's worth, it's worth noting that every GP in this country is a private individual. I mean, let's not forget that. All primary care is provided by private people. Um, I think that the private sector have a very important part to play in delivering health and social care. I think that uh, working in partnership with the public sector, with the NHS, is a very good way forward, and I would encourage that. Uh, Dennis Bacon. You, you'll probably all know what I'm going to say already, because uh, you know I've I've worked in the private sector for a long time, but I've also worked with within the uh, with with statutory sector partners, and uh, you know there's a lot of goodwill out there. But I mean, certainly in answer to the question, it's it's absolutely clear that what we are able to deliver, and it's not just the private sector; it's, it's also voluntary sector, but private sector, what we're able to deliver for the price that we're paid is incredible. The dedication of people who work in small care homes, particularly in, in home care agencies. They work hours that other people just wouldn't consider working, often seven days a week. I used to fund these places, and I can tell you that I, I often sat down with people that hadn't had a holiday for seven years. So when we think about our own entitlement, we have to think about what keeps this sector going. It is grossly underfunded. If we use the private sector, voluntary sector more, we will get a lot more out of it. Norman Lamb, grossly underfunded. So we have to go to the private sector, is that fair? Uh, well. Look, for, from my point of view, I, I just think we should concentrate on the quality of care. Uh, uh, and that should be, the, in a sense, the sole criterion. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, the, the polling actually suggests that the view of the public actually is rather different to what you imagine, that people uh, are, re are actually, on the whole, quite relaxed about who provides care. They just want good quality care. And that's, uh, there should be a completely level playing field. Uh, so that there aren't special favours for either side. Uh, and that's actually what we've introduced through the 2012 uh, Act. But I think the, the, the exclusive focus should be on quality of care. The truth, of course, is that there have been failures on both sides and, great, and examples of great care on both sides. So, you know, whenever um, I hear Andy Burnham, for example, uh, condemning pr the private sector, I just, you know, remind him about Mid Staffordshire Hospital where hundreds of people lost their lives through poor care. That was a, an NHS hospital. So it is, it's just as outrageous for someone to lose their life or to suffer negligent care in a, an NHS hospital as it is for the appalling abuse that happened at Winterbourne View, which was a private sector provider. So, you know, there's no monopoly here of, uh, uh, of, um, of great care. Uh, the focus, and, and that's why great regulation is so important, you have to have tough regulation, uh, <clears throat> you have also have to have incentives to improve, but ultimately uh, we should just focus on quality of care, not who provides it. Lady Joyce Hopwood. Um, well, well I, I'm here as the wild card, and so <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think, I think that Dennis finally thought that there were too many grey suits up here. So, I, for once, I absolutely agree with Norman that it's about quality and having the level playing field and enabling us people who are going to need your care to be confident that we're going to get the quality of care that we want and absolutely need and are even entitled to. And that, I think, is what really worries people is how can we know, unless there's a recent CQC report, how can we know that we're going to get the right quality of care? And it really doesn't matter, private or public. It's the quality that matters. 
Professor Martin Green, that's a good question, isn't it? How can we be sure? Well, I think we can be sure because we have things like the CQC reports, but also we can be sure because we have a sector that is very committed to quality. And there are always going to be people who fail, but they are the exception, not the rule. And I think I agree with both um, Lady Hopwood and also Norman when he talks about the fact we need a completely level playing field, we need to be sector neutral, people who use services want quality and outcomes. But I think the question was quite interesting because the issue of profit is the demon that everybody focuses on. Well, what I want to say is I think we should look at the real unit costs. So, for example, there is a lot of money spent in the statutory sector which goes nowhere near a patient or a user. It goes into pension fund contributions, £100,000 a minute in NHS spending on training, etc. And if you look at the cost and the outcome, that is the debate we need to have, not false debates about either profit or uh, public sector delivery. Are you saying we shouldn't be paying that money into a pension fund? Surely not. I'm saying that everybody should have that pension fund. And if, if everybody had that pension fund, we'd all be happy. But successive governments tell us that money purchase and uh, other pension schemes are good enough for the rest of us. Well, the question I want to ask is, why isn't it good enough for the public sector? And I speak as somebody who has a residual public sector pension from a previous <laughs> life. Harold Bodmer. Okay, so, so, I, so I don't want to discuss my public sector pension, <laughs> but I, 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 so I'm going to avoid that. But um, I, do, I do think, for, as far as social care is concerned, this is yesterday's argument, isn't it? This is, the issue surely is about new partnerships here between uh, the private sector and, uh, and, and the NHS and the local authority. So how, what a good plan it would be to have community nurses uh, providing clinical leadership to domiciliary care staff, home care staff, who work for the private sector, working as one team. And that's where we've got to be, I think. And unless we do that, locally around primary care, I think we're in a really difficult place. So I don't think it's about private and uh, uh, for profit at all. OK, we've got a question here. Um, thank you. My name is Margaret Somerville. I'm a county councillor. My question is about the Care Quality Commission and about the monitoring of services throughout the county. Who trains the monitors? Who evaluates the monitors when they have monitored? Can we be absolutely sure that their quality is high enough? And also, Mid Staffordshire occurred because people were not able to escalate their concerns higher up. Um, you've suggested that we can okay. contact Care Quality Commission uh, directly, but I don't think we can. All right. <laughs> I think, David Pryor, that is for you, isn't it? Thank you for that, Margaret. That's appreciated. <laughs> Margaret, I might add, used to work at the Norfolk and Norwich and was a governor of the Norfolk and Norwich as well. Um, we employ a thousand inspectors. Are all thousand inspectors going to be absolutely top quality? Of course they're not. But, you know, we, you know no organisation in the world is going to be perfect. So therefore, we have got a, a quality assurance process within CQC to, to try and get consistency across the piece. Um, but we're going to get better, Margaret. We're not perfect. And that's why I say we need feedback from people in this room. You know, will we get it wrong? We need to know. Um, I think we are using far more specialist inspectors now, and we're using far more experts by experience, i.e. patients and relatives. And I think our inspections are much better, much deeper, much more expert than they used to be. But are they perfect? No. So CQC monitors the hospital or the organization but nobody monitors CQC. Is that what you're saying? Um, no, I'm not saying that. Oh, okay. um, because, I mean, because that was the question, yeah. who monitors? Okay. Well, who we, monitors? We, we are accountable to the Health Select Committee and to ministers, and if we don't perform, you can be absolutely sure that we'll know all about it. Right. Still, still doesn't answer the question, who monitors the monitors? Who monitors our inspectors? Yep. Do you mean? Well, we have chief inspectors. Right. We, have, we, have Mike, we have Mike Richards, for example, who's the chief inspector for acute So who hospitals. monitors the chief inspector? Well, I monitor the chief okay, inspector. And, and I, in turn, am monitored by the Health Select Committee and by ministers. Right. Thank good. God, ultimately. <laughs> Actually, I thought in hospital cases, isn't God the patient? <laughs> or inpatient. Um, 
the just, microphone here. Yeah. There's a sense in which nursing home patients are treated differently to everybody else in this country because, because of the fact that in many areas they lack, they appear to lack an entitlement to NHS provision. This is increasingly becoming a, a problem in Norfolk as community nursing teams withdraw services which I think most nursing home workers believe they have an entitlement to. Major problem. I, I'm sorry, it's a question. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, who was the question? Who would you like to answer it? <laughs> um, I think that it, it's very much a health. No, give me. Yeah, who? All would? right. Um, uh, I think David, actually. All right. <laughs> God bless you, David. I don't know the answer to the question, okay. so you asked the wrong. I mean. I don't under, I don't, you'll have to rephrase the question, I'm sorry. No, just, I'm not going through that again. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> no, basically, uh, care ho people in care homes and nursing homes are regarded as almost second-class citizens. Because they don't have the uh, community nursing teams and sometimes GP practices will refuse to deliver a service because the nurses in that nursing home should deliver. There is a, a nurse may so, only perform those functions for which he or she... So there's a nursing the gap. Competence. There is a nursing gap, basically. I think... Go on. Yes, Norman. Uh, well, for, first I should say that uh, my mum, who uh, died in June at the age of 95, was a resident for a brief period of time at Suncourt Nursing Home in Sheringham, and uh, she received the most fantastic care. So, Tim, thank you very much indeed. And when I talk about uh, the quality that I see uh, in Norfolk, I've witnessed it personally, uh, and it's, it's fantastic. Um, and I think what I would say is that it's a very variable picture around the country. You make the point about GPs. Uh, it, it's extraordinary to me that uh, it's not just standard practice that GPs proactively are in the uh, care homes working as part of the team with the care home, with the nursing home, uh, providing the best possible care. And of course, this is the c greatest concentration of people who are most likely to go in and out of hospital. And if we get that coordination, uh, both with the GP and with community nursing services, far better, then we can stop the admissions to hospital, which are so devastating for the individual and so costly to the system. So this is all about the, the imperative to join up care in a much more effective way and to invest more in out-of-hospital care. Harold, yes. Harold Bobmer, very quickly. And then we'll move on to the next question. So I, I think this is an issue just about us being absolutely clear around what nursing homes are, uh, in, are, will do and what community nursing does. And this is part of us uh, developing a much stronger integrated offer around community services. I think we just have to have absolute clarity about that so that we don't let people drop. And what you're saying is we don't have clarity? No, we don't. So how do you improve clarity? Yes, Professor, go on, but very quickly and then we need to move just on. Just to say, we did some research on this in 2007 and we also did some follow-up research and it proves conclusively that lots of care homes not only don't receive services from GPs, but actually re are requesting to be paid retainers to get GPs in. And it is outrageous. And unfortunately, though, systemically, it's very difficult to get a GP to do anything unless you bribe them. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis Bacon. Uh, well, I, I think that might be a little bit unfair. <laughs> I mean, I, I do quite a lot of work with GPs, and there are, some, there are some very, very good GPs out there, so let's not forget that. Um, but I think it is, it is wrong that, that it is now often standard practice that retainers are paid. I mean, I think a really good forward-thinking GP practice should be going into their community nursing and, and care homes and, and, and offering services, because actually if they manage it proactively... But they're not doing it. That's, that's the thing. And I'm sure there are good GP practices not doing it. So... Somebody has to do something. Yeah, but I mean, the, 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 to, be, to be fair, this is, a, this is a huge shift that's required for GPs. And again, it, it revolves around culture. And we, don't, we, just don't, we just ignore it. We've had so many issues in this county that have is failed because we're, there's, we don't address the cultural issues. Is it because if a GP goes into a care home, he, is, he or she is going to be very, very busy and that workload is going to be too much? Yes, I think that's part, that's part of the problem. But, but this was going on 10, 15, 
20 years ago. So I think it's partly about profit what, okay. as well. What's, what's the average bribe, Martin? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 we discovered anything from 2,000 to 69,000 pounds. You, you're not... That's yeah. that, 69,000 pounds. No, it's not everyone. No, no, it's not everyone. But I remind everybody that the notion of free at the point of need for the health service should apply to everyone. So it's not every GP that's doing this, and some GPs are fantastic. But the fact that there is one that isn't doing it is a scandal. It, 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 and when you say it, it isn't happening free at the point of delivery, is there an age beyond which it stops happening as it should? Well, I think when people go into care homes, there's an expectation the care home will do everything that everybody else has done when a person's been in the community. And that was never what the care home was supposed to do. Okay. Is this a picture? <laughs> Just before the next question, hands up if this is a picture you recognise in this room. And if you don't recognise it, that's fairly, fairly solid, isn't it? Let's have our next question, please, Tracy. Thank you. There is a crisis in recruitment of good home care and care support workers. Just put the microphone a bit closer to your mouth, sorry. Yeah, go on, okay, off you go. Again. There is a crisis in recruitment of good home care and care support works, workers in the east of England. This seems to be due to a combination of negative publicity around social care, zero hour contracts and low pay relative to the level of responsibility. In addition, staff working in rural areas, they need their own transport to do the work. How can this problem be resolved in the short term and how can we ensure there are sufficient staff for future care needs? Zero hour contracts, all of that. Norman Lamb, um, I'm sure that you would like to say something about that. Well, first of all, I'll say something that might be uh, unpopular, but uh, our care system uh, in our own county and across the country uh, depends in part on some incredibly dedicated people from other countries uh, and, and the, the whole debate about immigration um, is very lopsided uh, and uh, our care, our health and our care system would quite frankly collapse without the extraordinary dedicated work of very many people and we owe them a debt of gratitude and we should thank them for the work that they do uh, to keep very many vulnerable people safe. It, uh, isn't that because they are prepared to work for lower wages? It, well, it, it, in part, it's also uh, the fact that when I talk but to... But if, if, if that's the case, isn't that wrong? Well, I, I've, I believe very strongly that we need to try to increase wage levels. It's very difficult because the finances are so tough at the moment, but that's why I argue the case for more investment in the sector. Better use of money and more investment. The two have to go hand in hand, but when I talk to care homeowners, I, I'm also told that they find it very difficult to recruit youngsters uh, in our county who, <coughs> who aren't uh, that interested in working in care. That, that's very sad, but, but, that, if you... but that's why I th also think that it's so important to have a career progression ahead of people. But if so you've got zero hours contracts, Nobody's going to want to do that. And you've got to run a car to get there if you live in rural areas. You just can't afford to do it, can you? I, I agree. And, Dennis and Bacon, come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, this was one of my main slides that you may, may, may or may not recall. I mean, I, I just... We, we've got a huge problem in this county. We've got a problem in the country. We are not paying these people enough. That is the solution, OK? Yes, there's got to be a career path, but you've got to start somewhere. And you can't start somewhere if you can't attract people in. So paying them £6, 80% of our workforce paid at minimum wage. Zero hours contracts. And as a sector, we're saying very clearly, there shouldn't. We want to get rid of zero hours contracts. That can only be done through effective commissioning. So we have to change the way we commission. And I know that, that Howard and his team are looking at that. But it still seems to me it's a bit of a race to the bottom all of the time. You know, which authorities are paying less? We have got to be prepared to pay our workforce a living wage, move towards that as soon as we possibly can. And I believe the money, there is money in the system to do it, but it means we've got to transfer some of that money from health into social care. Harold Bobner. So... I think this is about uh, looking at contracts differently and making the job uh, more uh, attractive for people, uh, making uh, the contracts more realistic in terms of what people are expected to do, and not sticking around uh, with time 
and task in the way that we currently do, as Norman uh, Lamb said earlier. So I think it, it, it's all of those things, and that's the work that we've got in hand. I think it's also about us joining up our approach to the workforce with the NHS. This is all the health and social care workforce. It, we've got it, to make it's all very well saying all of that, but actually, who's going to pay for it? Well, I think we've only got the money we've got. Yeah. So uh, all we can do is use the money we've got across the whole system as effectively as we can. And so it is, uh, what, if we can demonstrate in social care that we can keep people out of hospital by paying care staff more, by having different kinds of contracts, different kinds of partnership, the NHS colleagues will want to fund that as best they can. Lady Joyce. What do you think of the quality of care that we have in some of our establishments? I have no personal, well, as far as care homes are concerned, I have no personal experience. As far as the local hospital is concerned, I've had, I've had really good experiences um, and, and some not so good. Um, but I think that it is really, it's really difficult because these are all systems, and they're actually dealing with real people. And it's not person-centered the greater part of the time. It is sometimes, and I've had some excellent person-centered care, and I've also had the reverse. And it really needs to be that the message that people actually have a very clear view of what they like and what they don't like, of what they need and what they don't need, and they should be listened to. Are you, are you saying that the system doesn't listen to older people? Yes. Look how many people end up in hospital when they actually don't need to be there, they don't want to be there, they're scared of being there, and they'd be much better treated at home. I know Norman Lamb wants to come back. We've got a question over there on this. Uh, related to this, yeah. um, David Walker, I'm from Doughty's uh, Housing with Support and uh, winners of the Person-Centred Care Award this year. Um, That'll I'd, do for that. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to know, um, a, a lot's been talked about culture of the organisation and listening and person-centred care. So how important is candour? and what's happening to the duty of candour. Yes, Norman Lamb. Uh, well, two things. First of all, uh, go to Wiltshire, where they have changed the way in which they commission domiciliary care. They now commission on the basis of outcomes, uh, achieving great results for people. If you can maintain someone's independence, if you can maintain their mobility, if you can give them a good life, then uh, they stay independent for longer, they uh, are a lower cost to the system, everyone benefits, and their care workers are now paid a salary, not paid uh, on an hourly rate close to the bare minimum. So if they, can do it, they, if they can do it, why can't everybody else? That, well, that's the way we've got to go. We've, we've uh, uh, funded uh, uh, an approach to improving the quality of commissioning. We've got a model of how you should commission based on outcomes, and I think that Norfolk County Council is pursuing this very route. But on the issue of the duty of candour, we have legislated for it. We are introducing a duty of candour, a statutory duty of candour on the organisation, and it's just a duty to be open with people. It's it's not a complicated. When thing. we're talking about candour, what are we talking about? Are we it's, talking so it's so it's where, and it, I, I think it's of most importance in hospitals, but where someone suffers an injury or harm uh, of a significant nature, there must not be a cover up. Uh, you must be open with the individual and with the family. Okay. Um, Professor, do you want to come in on this very quickly and then we'll get another question? Another question well, from well I, I absolutely applaud the duty of candour, but I also think we've got to get to a point where when we are candid and when we do admit our mistakes, it's a learning process, not a point the finger process. And I like the airline industry approach, which is about giving people the, the space to talk about their critical incidents in a non judgmental way. That's my fault. Sorry about that. Question here very quickly. Mine, mine is uh, about recruitment. Uh, does, the ta does the panel think that some of the problems with recruitment isn't just about the wage, it's about unsociable working hours, weekends, evenings, accountability and uh, promotion uh, structure and uh, 
apprenticeships, we're finding it very difficult to get people to do apprenticeships in private homes. Um, and um, also, the biggest one of all is working up against the tax credit. We're just about to embark on a 6% pay rise for care staff. And all that will happen is they'll be with us less because they get to the tax credit level quicker and they don't want to touch that. They'd rather have the time off. Dennis Bacon. Very quickly, yeah. I think, I mean, I'd, I'd go back to a, um, a nursing home that uh, we, we opened and ran um, a number of years ago in 1997. It was a, a Ford Place at Thetford, which is a, a, a very nice home near the Nuns Bridges. And I was very proud of that, uh, very proud of that home. And we found after about a year, um, when I was uh, talking to the matron there and looking at some of the figures, that the, the staffing costs were, were increasing quite dramatically and we were getting, um, we were getting a lot of uh, agency you know, staff coming in. Um, and we, we, we did end up eradicating that. But I got, we got the rosters out and we, we looked at... I said, well, come on, let's get the rosters out, let's have a look. So we, we, we looked at uh, all of the people we employed. We employed um, about 70 people there and about 20, 25, 28 nurses. And um, the matron worked full-time. Her sister-in-law, who was deputy matron, worked full-time. And one other lady who was also near retirement age worked full-time. Every other nurse and a number of the uh, carers... And this is going back some years... Uh, only worked two shifts a week. So we said, well, come on, let's just get people to work more. And I had no idea that the problem was actually in the system and the benefit system. And they, these are working benefits. So when we talk about perverse incentives, one of the biggest and most challenging of the perverse incentives, and it's not just about low pay, this, is, this affects people in middle incomes as well, is that they're often better off for working less. So unless we, unless we deal with that, we face that, then we, we are actually creating a further perverse incentive that is, that is going to destabilise uh, the market. So I absolutely agree. I think the, 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 the benefit okay. side of it is, is working against us. A question from Tim Armitage. Does the panel agree that the council paying its own Norse care homes hundreds of pounds per resident per week more than independent voluntary and charity homes to do the same job is unfair, anti-competitive, and not representing best value for the vast majority of Norfolk people not in or working for a Norse care home. Nobody had... <laughs> Nobody had any doubt that question was for you. Sure. <laughs> so the short answer is no. Uh, 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 but the longer answer is, I think there are some misunderstandings about the Norse care arrangement here. Uh, which is probably important to spell out, and I'm happy to do this in more detail afterwards, but just to, in, in essence, this is about transformation of 26 residential care homes that, frankly, in terms of physical environment, the County Council had run for years and uh, tried to transfer to the independent sector and failed uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and failed for a number of reasons, one of which because, was because of the uh, condition of the estate. These are homes built in the 60s and 70s that require at a conservative estimate about 60 million to bring them up to, uh, to uh, standard and uh, failed also because of something we were talking about earlier which is local authority terms and conditions. So uh, what happened is this was a cheapy transfer of 1,600 staff who provide uh, uh, care in those 26 homes and in 13 housing with care units. Uh, with a 15-year transformation program which will require uh, Norse Care to modernise the homes, converting them into uh, dementia care and in partnership with housing associations, sorry Stuart, I know this is a long answer, no, no. in partnership with housing associations uh, and others, uh, housing with care. So, I mean, actually we need to look at the figures because I don't think it is hundreds of pounds per week, first of all, and secondly, uh, actually part of what that buys is the access to that capital and that transformation. In addition to that, Norse provide a rebate back to the council of a million pounds a year, which goes directly into purchase of care. And in addition to that, uh, and, and well publicised in, um, in the county council's uh, budget setting, uh, the Norse care contract is being reduced by 4.5 uh, million over the next uh, three years. So this year, Norse is paying the county council three million pounds, all of which is going back into buying care or preventing further savings uh, against buying care in the sector. But if so it's quite if, as simple as, as if, a, a like you, for like comparison. If the council can afford to pay Norse care homes 
that amount of money, surely it should be paying the other care homes. Well, Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. But, but it's a different uh, contract and uh, the no, other No, no, what he's saying is it shouldn't be a different contract, well, I think. it's a transformational contract. The County Council, we pay Norse Care less than we paid ourselves to run those homes. So, in fact, I think this is good value for the Norfolk tax. So you're saving money on what you used to pay yourself, so you would have a bit over which you could pay the private? Well, the, the, the saving goes, yeah, well, exactly, and that's exactly what's happening. That is precisely what's happening. You're Three million pounds happening. a year is going back in to a purchase of care, which goes to the private sector. Right. Dennis Bacon, do you want to... <laughs> well, we've already you had don't a, have to sigh. We've, we've already had two or three dust-ups on this, Harold and I. We, we, we agree on an awful lot. I'm afraid I, I absolutely disagree. Um, I think that it's fundamentally wrong. I think it sends out absolutely the wrong message. You've got to pay people. If we talk about social justice, we talk about equality of opportunity. How can we have the same kind of conditions, the contracts, in terms of what we're required to deliver for our service users and yet pay one group a lot more. And we say it's not hundreds of pounds a week. Well, we don't really know. It's what we suspect from some anecdotal stuff that we're aware of. But we, we actually have asked these questions. Members have asked these questions, but they haven't been answered by the council. So Harold Bobmer, come on then. Let's ask the question and see whether we can get an answer, <laughs> shall we? So, um, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> no, you're right. You, no have, is a you have asked the questions, <laughs> and as a council, I think we've not answered them. So uh, we, we will answer them, so it, okay. uh, it, as, as far as we absolutely can, because I do, think it do, is based Do we know when we can answer them? Well, uh, yeah, no. we, okay. we'll make those, those that, I mean, okay. I'm not going to go through all of them. No, no, I don't want you to. I but guess I, we probably <laughs> haven't got time for us to, to, to do that. But certainly, I think it is really important that this, this is a transformational part of developing the sector. Uh, it's one part of the sector, it's only 13% of the, 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 uh, the care market. And, and actually, as we do this transformation, transformation, it will reduce. So, yeah, we need to answer questions about the cost. It's based on anecdote. David I Pryor, I know you, you probably don't know the figures either, but do you think that that seems right? You need a microphone. Um, I think the issue is around a level playing field, actually. Yeah. And I think, um, I think, you, I think the council have to be completely transparent so that that's to give confidence to them. Are we happy with that? Yeah, I know, I tried to get the how much, but I, I think he is going to answer that. He has promised, I think, it opens... I can say that in 2013, before uh, the April increase then, it, the difference, I think, uh, independent dementia care was 420, and uh, Norse care was 610 on average, paid whether that bed was occupied or not. Uh, and that was a massive difference. And then since then, uh, I think Norse care has had a percentage increase in line with our percentage increase, so obviously a lot more than the increases we've had, plus their wage increases paid on top of that. I'm, I'm sure that you will debate those figures, but do, do you accept that those figures are kind of in line with what? I, I, think, the, uh, I think the figure for the Norse Care dementia bed is beds are less than that, but I'll provide those figures Good. to you. Okay. I, I think, think that's probably the... Yeah, I think that we should leave it there. Big, yeah. the um, but, but just remember you will this provide was a 2p transfer of 1,600 staff with all their local authority pension liabilities. Right. And we're back to pensions, Professor, aren't we? <laughs> Good. Uh, anybody else want to come in on this before we go? Lady at the back there very quickly, I'm sorry. Oh, that's me. Sorry? Oh, go on then. Yeah, get on with it. Go now. on then. <laughs> I've just been told to get on with it. Diana, <laughs> Diana Staines from Centre 81 and also Norfolk Community Transport Association. Community transport is part of the infrastructure of services for people in Norfolk. It supports individuals, it supports families, it supports health care and adult social care. What is being done by commissioners to make sure that Community transport is part of the integrated care plan for the future so that individuals, so that we can save health money, we can make sure people access the services and it supports individual and community well-being. Just a very quick one from you, Mr Bobmer, on that about transport. Are you integrating it? Uh, yes, uh, we are and uh, we've, uh, we're doing a lot of work now looking at transport for the future because we spend an awful lot on transporting people to services. We want to be clear that we're transporting the right people to services. Frankly, we can no longer afford to transport people who have 
uh, uh, motability cars and uh, um, uh, mobility benefits, so we need to make sure about that. And part of that is increasing our support for community transport. Very quickly, Norman Lamb. Yeah, part of the solution to keeping our health and care system sustainable is the role for the much wider community. And uh, I just put in a plug for the most amazing community organisations like the whole Caring Society, uh, where a whole network of volunteers uh, take people to hospital appointments, to GP appointments, and so on. If you could have that sort of fantastic organisation run by really dedicated individuals doing it on an entirely voluntary basis, if you had that sort of thing in every community, you could make such a difference. Uh, my mum used to rely on it constantly. Uh, and it's just provided uh, entirely without uh, uh, support or subsidy from the state. We have to do much more of this sort of thing. So this is David Cameron's big society, is it? Well, yeah, but <laughs> okay. they... We'll but, move on but, to the next it question. It long before David Cameron <laughs> okay. turned up. Next question here, please, Thank from you, Mark sir. Talbot. Uh, mental health services in Norfolk have been the subject of both local and national criticism by politicians and media. Real terms funding for people with enduring mental health needs is now reducing, whilst demand is increasing. Providers feel that the needs of many people are not being met and that those responsible for making funding decisions are directing vulnerable people to the cheapest services, leading to unnecessary risk and readmission to hospitals where beds are closing. How does the panel view the current situation in the context of parity of esteem for mental health and how the problem of underfunding can be addressed? Well, I know you feel very strongly about this, Mr Lamb, so you can go well, first. Well, I, I sort of set out in my speech that I think there is a central discrimination at the heart of the NHS. If you have a whole load of rights and entitlements in physical health and you have nothing in mental health, if you have a funding system in physical health, which means that every time a patient goes to a hospital, the hospital gets paid, but a completely different system in uh, mental health where you just get a block grant, uh, it just, it's as sure as night follows day that mental health will lose out, and that's what's happened. Uh, on top of that, we had the most outrageous decision by Monitor and NHS England this year to require a bigger efficiency saving in mental health than in physical health. It was completely without justification, and I condemned it at the time. Uh, uh, so, and, and that won't happen ever again. I'm quite sure of that. And I think uh, I see my job as just being a, a, a very strong advocate for mental health and uh, making the moral and the economic case for it. It is so stupid to fail to invest in mental health and to treat it in an inferior way to physical health. And I think actually things are changing now. I was talking to a group of GP commissioners in London last night uh, and they were talking about how their, uh, their organisations, their clinical commission groups are changing their attitude and recognising that invest, investing in mental health makes sense. But, you know, it's across the country, it's a variable picture, uh, but I think that by introducing rights to access treatment in mental health uh, is the way that you achieve genuine equality. Uh, I can sort of proselytise as much as I want, and it will have some impact, but you've got to have an equality of rights before you will really get change. You, you did say at the end of your uh, speech today you didn't know how much longer you were going to be in that job. So how confident are you that it will change before you are out of that job? Uh, well, uh, well um, we, I mentioned the autumn statement, which comes at the beginning of December. We are, we are arguing the case for more funding for the NHS, but we're arguing within that that mental health must get uh, extra support, and in particular, children's mental health. Well, just, just tell us in this room, has the Chancellor given you a nod and a wink and said, yes, you're OK, Norman? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to share it with you. It's, uh, it's work in progress, but I'm quite confident we will achieve something, uh, because I think the case is overwhelming. Professor? Well, I just want to say a thanks to Norman for his leadership on that, but we can't leave this totally to Norman. This has to be something that we all pick up and keep on the agenda Hopefully he'll be in his job, but he, even if he isn't, uh, let's keep it on the agenda. It's not just his role, it's our role too. David Pryor? When we started doing our new inspections of mental health, that there was a feeling that perhaps we ought to make a, just come to a general view, actually, that mental health failed everywhere. That, it, you know, the model of mental health in England had failed, and it had failed through years and years of underfunding and years and years of not having parity of esteem. Um, but in fact, we're not doing that, and we are finding that some mental health care trusts are a lot better than others. 
Um, we are, have just inspected the Norfolk and Suffolk Mental Health Care Trust, and the results of that inspection are not yet public, so I won't comment on that. Uh, but I think I just make one observation yes. that as we try and get these efficiency savings across the NHS, there will be a huge pressure to do mergers. Mergers are really difficult to do, and we've seen that in Norfolk and Suffolk, I think. You know, mergers are not the panacea that we might think they are. Um, w without tiptoeing into any kind of uh, information that you can't share with us, but when you look at it, why is it that a merger doesn't work? I don't think you're tiptoeing into it. I think you're blundering. Yeah, I, think, oh, no. <laughs> I said um, I didn't want to tiptoe. <laughs> well, I think the most difficult thing about a merger is you're taking the t different cultures from two different organizations. Mergers tend to work when there's a takeover and one culture prevails and you have a strong company or a strong hospital taking over a weak one. When you have two weak ones, merging together, you tend to end up with a very big weak one. What, what I don't understand is that you say there are places in the country where it is better than it is in other places. How, how come, A, it's better in those places? Do they get more money or what happens? Um, and B, why don't local organisations share information and make themselves better before the CQC comes along? We don't have a national health service. We have a whole series of different health regions and economies with massive variation. And that's true of mental health, it's true of all health care. And the one thing we've found over the last year is that the scale of this variation is huge. It can be from one hospital to another, 10 miles down the road can be hugely different. And it's extraordinary to me that within a national health service that we don't share best practice to a much, much higher degree than we do. Good. Norman Lamb. You, you asked the question about why the variation. Uh, I see around the country some absolutely brilliant uh, mental health services, Re really inspiring. I was in Manchester last week. Uh, they have a, a really impressive team that uh, assesses people over a 48-hour period instead of just admitting them uh, for often a very long stay. Many of those people end up not being admitted and going home with support. Uh, they're using money much more effectively. If you look around the country, there's enormous variation in length the stay and the really inspiring leaders are recognizing that on the whole if you reduce length of stay which often has no clinical justification you can then invest in the brilliant preventive care in recovery in the community supporting fantastic organizations whether it's private uh, third sector or statutory doing that preventive work so there are really great progressive, inspiring leaders who are changing services, using money much more effectively, and then you get other services which are literally failing people in a very serious way. You see, way. if I was in government, I would go out and I would, I would smack heads together and say, look, they've got it right. Why don't you get it right? I spend my life doing that. <laughs> see, I set them up, you knock them down. Joyce Hopwood. Right. Well, uh, it's really interesting because we've had a lot of discussion about mental health but not anybody at all has mentioned the major growing area of mental health, which is dementia. And the growth in dementia is enormous. And there needs to be a much bigger focus on enabling people to learn about dementia, to have every workforce properly taught so that they know how to deal with their patients and to have everybody giving people with dementia the care and support that they deserve. Because currently, it is happening in some places, but only in some places. And the growth in numbers is so great that there needs to be a much faster, much bigger application of effort in this area. Is that, when you, when you say that, is it that GPs don't recognize it or hospitals don't deal with it properly? Where's the problem? GPs have been a bit loath to diagnose it for a number of reasons, some of which are really good in that they, they thought it would upset people, it would worry them, that um, there was nothing that could be done. Now, right now we know that if people are diagnosed early, it gives them a chance to put their affairs in order for a start. 
they can immediately, or real, very reasonably immediately, organize a power of attorney while they have the capacity to do so. They can organize a will, they can organize an advanced decision, they can organize DNR if that's what they want. But they have the opportunity in the beginning to n decide for themselves how they want their life to continue and how they want their life to end. D David Pryor, just, just quickly on that. Uh, uh, has there been, a, I mean, from the CQC, do you see that there has been a reluctance to pass on a diagnosis in this area? Um, I think um, for the reasons that Joyce gave, you know, many GPs have been reluctant to, to do an early diagnosis. And, and, but I think the benefits of an early diagnosis are now beginning to, um, to be more recognized. I mean, I mean, on George's broader point, I mean, dementia is probably the single biggest um, issue facing the health and social care system. Um, 30, I said in my talk, 34% of the people in the Norfolk and Norwich here today have got dementia. And they're not in there because they've got dementia, they're there for some other reason, but they've also got dementia. Now, the ability for an acute hospital to treat people with dementia is hugely difficult, and it's desperately disorientating for the, for the patient. And for those people to be in, a, in, a, in an acute hospital bed, often suffering from dehydration, they're not getting the, the food they might have got if they'd been at home or in, in, a, in a nursing home. They're not getting the stimulation, they're probably taking more um, um, sedation than they would do if they were outside. They're not getting that, all that really specialist special dementia care that many people in this room have learned to deliver is a huge problem. And we have got to get those people out of acute hospitals as an absolute priority. Yeah. Do, oh, just, does anybody else want to come on this very quickly? Yes, Dennis, I'll come back to you. you Oh, you're going to take over, right? Two, two days ago, um, uh, I was speaking to the, the, the lead consultant on dementia in the Norfolk and Norwich, and, and he told me that in the two years that he's been there, there has been a major change, and that now they are offering training to every part of the hospital that wants it, and people are now queuing up to get training in dementia care which is a major development, Good. and long may it continue. Lovely. Dennis Bacon. I mean, for, for, for many years, we, we had a mental health trust in Norfolk that simply didn't listen. That's a fact. I mean, that's my, my area of very passionate about mental health, and Norman and I have spent a lot of time talking about it, and we've attended meetings and, and challenged the mental health trust. When, when the mental health trust um, decided to effectively to take over, really, of Suffolk, a merger, and I'm going to return to this point that, that David made. I was really opposed to it because Norfolk had its own problems, lots and lots of problems, taking over another trust, not dissimilar size, with even bigger problems. So are we surprised that we, we, we then had huge problems? You know, you've, if, you're going to have a, if you're going to orchestrate a takeover, you've got to be very, very clear about what you're going to do. And you cannot do it by thinking that it's all going to be done through systems and processes. It goes back again to culture. You had two completely different cultures... And it, 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 it just simply hasn't worked. So if you, don't, if you don't address that and you don't align the cultures, then you end up with what we've, we have in Norfolk, and they've got a huge job on there. There's new people in, uh, at the helm, and we've got to give them a chance. But the situation's getting worse because of all of the neglect of the previous years, and that's my, that's my view. So we really must do more about understanding the importance of getting the cultural side of it right. Harold Bodmer, do you want to come back on that? Or? No. No, OK. I... <laughs> He's almost preempting something, isn't he? We don't want to go there. Uh, let's have our last question, please. Yes, this is uh, Roger Andrews. Hi, I'd like to ask a question about the use of uh, CCTV in care settings. Uh, CQC have made some supportive statements about its use in appropriate circumstances, and a large healthcare provider uh, has done a survey showing that uh, a significant majority of of uh, relatives and staff would support it, uh, the latter possibly to see it as a way of protecting themselves. But the same survey showed that uh, a majority of residents uh, did not want CCTV. Given that we might not see it as person-centered, uh, as representative of, of normal living, and it infringes possibly on privacy and dignity, can we have the panel's views? 
Joyce Hopwood, what do you think? <laughs> you are the wild card. Yes, um, I am the wild card. I'm, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure I got the... CCTV the pictures, Sorry? CCTV cameras in care homes. Yes. Everybody seems to want it apart from the residents. It really is a very difficult issue because the invasion of privacy of the resident themselves is huge. And yet the anxiety that comes from the relatives who are not sure, especially in cases of people with dementia, who are not sure that their relative is actually being cared for appropriately and with dignity and respect. The anxiety on the behalf of the relatives is huge. And clearly, the anxiety on behalf of the staff is huge too, because they feel that what, almost whatever they do can be misconstrued. So are you saying we, we need to adopt the least worst option? Yes. Which is CT? Well, no, no it <laughs> isn't. <I> okay. mean, <laughs> It, it really isn't that simple. I don't think it's that simple, and I don't think it's actually that effective for people to feel they're being perpetually watched. I, I think there's something quite eerie about it. David Pryor. I think it's very interesting in the um, survey, the poll that you referred to, that was done by one of the bigger pet care groups, is that the, and what we've done, it's very clear that relatives are more anxious than the residents. And that's because the residents often feel guilty about putting someone into a care home. They read things in the newspaper about things going wrong. There is a huge degree of anxiety. I think we have to distinguish between covert surveillance and overt surveillance. And I think that covert surveillance, I mean, our advice is it is a last resort. But if, if parents, uh, if, uh, if relatives feel that one of their loved ones is being abused in a care home, um, they've raised it through the normal channel, they still feel that's happening, then I think they're, they're, they are entitled to use covert surveillance, and I think they would then be advised, if they get some footage of abuse happening, to tell us about it. But it is a last resort, and it should not be necessary. Now, overt surveillance, um, having visible CCTV, I'm not sure that does a lot of good, because if someone is doing abuse, they're going to avoid the cameras anyway. So, so you're saying covert would be put in by whom? By the well, family? Or it's by actually been put, put in by Panorama on a number of occasions. Yeah. Um, God uh, bless the BBC, David, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that if I had, uh, if my mother goes into a care home, and I felt that she was being abused, and I had some real concerns about it, I had lost confidence, and I could not move her somewhere else, I would personally wish to do everything I could to see whether that was happening. So I can, I can Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think the idea that you get great care by putting a camera in every bedroom and every care home is just ridiculous. Uh, and it's, it is a complete assault on your privacy. Uh, as Joyce has rightly said. But I think we also have to recognize that some appalling abuses have been exposed by covert uh, cameras. So Winterbourne View, for example, that may never have come to light. That, you know, those assaults on people with learning disabilities without it being filmed. And so I think the sort of sensible conclusion to reach is to recognize that it can sometimes have a role in investigating serious wrongdoing. Uh, and so if the Care Quality Commission, for example, uh, believed, and I think they've been reviewing their uh, view of this, if they believed that there was uh, potential evidence of serious abuse or neglect, then it may well be appropriate to use that as part of their investigation. And indeed, a family must surely have the right if they are fearful of abuse of a loved one. So I think that's the sort of approach we should take, Harold, targeted in specific circumstances. Harold Bobmer. Yeah, just a comment. I can't help feeling, but what an indictment of the care sector and all that we've been having this discussion, yeah. really. And I guess, uh, in a sense, the onus is on us as commissioners and providers to make sure that we're never in a situation where that is necessary in Norfolk. I think that's all that I want to say about this. I mean, I, I can't disagree with the, the other comments that have been Professor, made. Professor, yeah. 
Yes, I mean, I think it has to be absolutely of the last resort. Um, and I think also, though, we should be mindful that sometimes relatives' views might not be the views that we take into account. This is about the people themselves. And I refer to the point, would I want a television camera in my bedroom? Interestingly as well, if you looked at television cameras as a way of stopping abuse, they'd be all over the BBC, they'd be all over schools, <laughs> they'd be in all the places where abuse takes place. So I think we should remind ourselves that actually this is about making sure there is good quality safe care that is free from abuse and that's all our responsibilities and the fact that there might be a television bit of footage after the event is no substitute to making sure the event doesn't happen. Dennis Blake. I think we're all pretty much aligned on that. I think it would be a, a terrible thing if it became, became the norm. It's got to be really the exception and the circumstance that's been outlined. The only thing I would say is going back to Winterbourne View is an, and that expose, which I found one of the most disturbing and upsetting things I've ever seen. Um, I, where were the commissioners in this? I mean, this is something that I think we need to also consider, that, that, that you know, commissioners have a real responsibility to ensure that they are monitoring and they are commissioning the right services because I mean this abuse was going on for a very long time so I think that there is a it, it's very important that we don't see cameras as any kind of solution because actually they're not I think it would be a retrograde step absolutely but I do think that we need to ensure that everybody sees that they have a responsibility towards uh, monitoring and it's not just left to CQC to go in and find it happening because that's very unlikely to be to be the case. Do you know when I saw this question first of all the first line I thought it was to do with patient care and I think that is where we should be looking first of all isn't it? Would it help in patient care? I don't know but we have discussed it all to do with abuse of the patient and it is as you say Harold Bodmer pretty sad that we have to think that patients when they are most vulnerable are being abused. Who thinks that CCTV is a good idea? Just give me a show of hands quickly. <laughs> Go on, one of you must. Who thinks they're a bad idea? Sorry? If there is a suspicion of abuse, that's it. Listen, thank you very much for your question. Yeah, one. Go on then, quickly. Not a statement, a question? Yeah? CCTV might be abuse in selective circumstances, but people must be absolutely clear it is not a cure for a poor culture. That rests with management and leadership in the home. And CQC and everybody CQC else. And all the, yeah. 